Okay, well, <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, or evening, as the case may be, and welcome to our friends uh, across the nation and around the world. My name is Eugene Rule, and I have the pleasure and privilege of introducing our sp speaker. And I'm not going to give you our usual spiel uh, about the Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library, or ICSS, and how much we respect the work of Karl Marx. And although we differ on how to interpret Karl Marx, we all agree that it's important. And uh, we want to change the world and not just talk about it. You've already heard all that before, and you can read more on our website, icssmarx.org. Also, I want to mention that our scheduled speaker Roger Harris was pressured to go to Ecuador to monitor the election there today. Uh, but he did talk Laura Wells into joining us and Laura wrote, uh, we'll probably have more to say about that later. And it's my sad duty to inform you that Ramsey Clark died peacefully on Friday, April 9th at his home in New York City. He was 93 <laughs> years old. And as you know, he was attorney general I think both during the Kennedy and Johnson administrations and was largely responsible for anything good that happened during those administrations. Um, later, he founded the International Action Center as a leading opponent of US uh, imperialism. And you can read Gloria LaRiva's obituary in the PSL newspaper, uh, Liberation. And now I want to talk about my good friend, Laura Wells, who just returned from two weeks in Nicaragua with a delegation sponsored by a variety of peace groups. Laura is a longtime political and social activist and a leader in the Green Party, which she joined in 1992. Uh, with her leadership, the Alameda County Green Party became, in my view, one of the best organized and effective uh, party organizations in the state. In 2002, she garnered nearly a half a million votes in her run for California state uh, controller, which is very good for a non, I think you call them the Titanic parties. Um, uh, so uh, she's also has run for governor and state uh, and, and Congress. And as a former um, systems analyst, Laura supports taxing the rich, implementing public banks, and refusing corporate money. Uh, she ran for governor and Congress as the Green a candidate of the Green Party. And I've known Laura for over 10 years, ever since I escaped from my 20-year exile in Southern California and began running for Congress here in my native Bay Area with the Peace and Freedom Party. But I found Laura's Green Party a valuable ally and it's a testament to Laura that although she's a strong advocate of the Green Party, she is not, does not advocate them in a narrowly partisan manner. And that's why when Laura was running for governor in 2010, um, a bunch of us Peace and Freedom types went over to uh, Dominican University in San Rafael for the quote, debate between the Republican and Democratic candidates. No other candidates were allowed uh, and it was not open to the public. Admission was by invitation only. It turns out, however, that Laura had a ticket, but when she tried to go in, they recognized her and arrested her. Now the so-called debate itself was Dolesville City but Laura's arrest made national news on CNN and other news organizations. And you can watch her interview on Democracy Now! Uh, aired a few days later on October 14th, uh, 2010. And I still remember what Laura told me uh, about that incident. She said, they can arrest us, but they can't stop us. And for me, that pretty much defines who Laura is and why we're so fortunate to have her today and we need to pay attention to her. And with that, let me turn it over to Sharon Rose who will 
uh, moderate our program today and tell us what we need to know to function. Uh, so over to you, Sharon. Who has to unmute herself? Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, that was delayed. Um, so we're gonna have Laura speak for about an hour and then we're gonna have um, questions and discussion and I will call on everyone for um, um, two minutes, is it, is it two minutes or three minutes? I've forgotten, but anyway, there will be some. Two, two, I think. Two minutes. Uh, two minutes, and that, that will, in order to let everyone have, who wants to speak have a chance. And then at the end, we usually have 15 minutes uh, or half an hour, depending on where we are. But up until one o'clock, we have a little time of more free flowing discussion with less moderation. So at the end, you can jump in um, when you want to. But when we get there, I'll, I'll, I'll signal that. So without further ado, let's have Laura. Okay, thank you. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. But I have to say that Greg Jan looks like he's on the Zoom. And if you want to look at the leader of the Green Party of Alameda County, that would be Greg Jan. I'm happy to sometimes help. Um, and I, I want to thank ICSS for having me and Roger Harris, who was planning to do a uh, the Zoom this morning, but as uh, as Jean said, he's in Ecuador. And the last I heard from one of our leaders in um, of the Nicaragua delegation that we just finished, her name is Terry Matson, and she's a strong Code Pink and Task Force on the America um, delegation leader. And Mehmet, and you know, is. Rick is nodding his head because two years ago we went to Venezuela with her. And just recently what they said is that it's aroused by two to five points as we begin the day in, Nick, in Ecuador, because that's where Roger Harris is as uh, one of the observation, uh, observers of the Ecuadorian election. So, you know, <laughs> buena suerte. You know, we have, we have a lot of esperanza for that. Uh, happening in Ecuador in order to turn it around from uh, the neoliberalism to the ongoing revolution toward the people. Um, I also wanna, I, I'll try to remember this at the end, but I also wanna say now that uh, Green Sunday, uh, Alameda County Green Party always has a, a Green Sunday almost every second Sunday and it's at five o'clock. And tonight's is on Julian Assange. So that should be very interesting. Anybody who happens to be green can stay on at 6.30 and take part in a, a 15 minute um, bylaw change. So that would be important, but that should be a very good uh, green Sunday on Assange at five o'clock. So what I'm going to do, uh, when I woke up this morning, I decided I was going to try to pull together a little slideshow. So I'm going to do that next and have that be uh, fairly quick and then um, just uh, tell you about what, what uh, I have to say about Nicaragua and Latin America. So I think this will work. Can you see? Yes, it's working. Okay, that is Sandino. Um, and that's where Sandinistas came from. Sandino lived from 1895 until 1934. So if you add that together, he was a young man. He was assassinated just before um, the Somoza dictatorship happened for 43 years. And then that's when the Sandinistas, named after him, uh, took uh, the presidency of Nicaragua in 1979. So this is the, at the bottom, you can see the, the, the group of us, there were about a dozen of us. What was amazing about this group is that 
they almost everybody was young, you know, and by young, I mean 40 or younger. And a lot of them had a parent or two that was from Latin America. So the bilingual, um, almost, you know, like eight people were bilingual in Spanish and English. So it was wonderful to have the, the young people there, um, as well as all that language. So this is a huge st uh, statue. As you can see, people recognize Sandino by his silhouette. This is a, the famous representation of him that happens all over. The, and you see the flag, the FSLN, um, which is the... What is it? Um, uh, the Frente Sandinista de Liberación Nacional, the FSLN black and red, and the uh, Nicaraguan flags blue and white. Okay, so this is um, a piece of, I guess you could call it propaganda. It's in an airport, but it's uh, uh, let's go forward. It's Daniel Ortega, who was president from 1979 until 1990, and then again from 2007 to the present time, and there's an election coming up. And so it's Christian, socialist, and uh, solidarity, solidarity in faith, family, and community, and in vic victories. So that's what the Spanish says. And that's what they're about. I was wondering on my way there what their relationship was with Hugo Chavez. Somehow I didn't know that. And as we were driving along, you can see I'm taking this out of the back seat of a car. Um, I could see in the middle of a roundabout on the main highway, there's Hugo Chavez. And so he was a, a great friend of Nicaragua and vice versa. This, we had many, many presentations and I just have this one that I want to share. Um, She's uh, indigenous, she's married to somebody who's been a long time Latin American uh, activist that uh, our, our delegation leader, uh, Terry Matson, uh, knew Nils before he was married and then she saw him again. He has a, a small child named Fidel, of course, and a child on the way. She told us about the social media um, boosted U.S. boosted attack on Nicaragua that happened in April 2019. Uh, Erica Takeo is also in this picture. She was she lives in Nicaragua, although she was born and raised in Seattle, Washington, and she is part of the Friends of the ATC. So I'm going to show you my T-shirt. I'll, I'll try to show you that when when I'm not just a tiny little thing, so you can read it a tiny little photo. Okay, uh, well, Brian Wilson, uh, the one who lost his legs when a train didn't stop, and um, Paul Oquist um, and me. Uh, but we, this was a, a dinner where I have to tell you I had the most delicious fish I've ever eaten in my life. But um, Brian Wilson has been living there for, I think it might be four years and he's a strong uh, supporter of Nicaragua, as is Paul Oquist, who's been there m many more years than that, maybe 40 or 50. Um, and he, he's among the sanctioned people because he talks in, uh, you know, because he supports Nicaragua, which is one of the troika of tyranny, if you wanna believe um, our, the US government, starting with, uh, with John Bolton. Okay, next. Now, for some reason, I am screen sharing and it's not All right. Hold on just a second, this should work. Okay, um, one of the wonderful things about traveling and loving birds is that you get to, uh, to you know, it, it, it's an add-on to a political delegation. And if you can see this bird, look where the tail is and you can just barely make out these two feathers at the end of these long two string tail. Look up national bird of Nicaragua and you will see this gorgeous bird. It's called Guarda Barranco, which means it guards the cliff because that's where its nests are. But I saw that on the first day and never again. So I thought, welcome to Nicaragua. There's the the national bird. Look it up, it's really beautiful. 
And here is a howler monkey. Um, as we went on a little boat trip, if you can see that, there's Terry Madsen. Some of you will know her. She was one of our co-leaders of the delegation. This, we were in Granada, which is a tourist, it's a colonial city, it's a tourist destination. Whole bunch of islands. This is just one where there's a bed and breakfast on the island. And so it's a great tourist destination, of course, being a sanctioned country and being in the middle of a pandemic. Um, uh, it's hard, you know, tourism has gone down, but it's a wonderful, but tourism is an important thing in, in almost all the poor countries in Latin America, tourism is very important. So if you ever consider going there, please do. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out that really amazed me was this, this is just a tiny portion of a huge park in Managua, which is the capital of Nicaragua. Uh, and it's free and the families go there, you know, the whole family goes there, the whole thing is free. And, um, and it's the recognition that it's important for people to um, enjoy themselves and to have the places where families can go together for free. Here's another little uh, whimsical part of the park. And it also had uh, boats and stuff like that. So now we're gonna switch toward um, what this says is a plan of production for the um, self-sufficiency and the sustain and, and the economic sustainability. Um, and I'm going to point this out because it has cow was cows and pigs. And one of the things that they've done is to give every female head of the household, every woman in a, in a household, whether she's married or, or not, a pregnant cow or a pregnant pig. And then that will help her be economically um, uh, sustainable individually. And it certainly helps, um, you know, with the food sovereignty, which they've got in Nicaragua. Here is one of the places that we stayed. I've never stayed in such a rustic place in my life. I start to realize how luxuriously I usually live. Um, th that's the bathroom. You might be able to see the little roll of toilet paper um, and a pig wandering around in a motorcycle, a pretty common um, way, method of transportation, plus the beauty of the flowers and all of that. But the bedrooms were separate rooms. The bathroom, which the door didn't quite close, you know, you just had to get used to it. Um, and the kitchen, they were all these separate rooms, um, but it was their farm. Uh, there's been land um, redistribution. You, if you don't own the land, you are in a much worse shape. So this is the son. He's 13 years old. He's just, he was just a delight. So I have a picture of him. And this shows him as well, um, where he just uh, graduated, I think, from the sixth grade. Uh, but I want to point out, and I'll also point out later, how important their school, their education system is. So he's up in this rural place, and they have a, they have schools up there. This is his mother, um, and she taught me to make my first and only tortilla, which I'm eating right now. And that was in the separate kitchen. This is Dios bendice nuestro uh, hogar. May God bless our home. It's very Christian, um, mostly Catholic, but some of them have turned away from the Catholic Church. And this, uh, uh, so this set of slides is showing some of the people. This is Alexander. And I said, Alejandro? And they said, no, Alexander is his name and his beautiful mother. And they went everywhere with us. He was, the, I just love this baby. Um, here's another picture. This is uh, where we went to uh, one of the, islands in the semi-autonomous zone um, that are, that are Afro-descendant as well as indigenous. And there's Alexander and Yamir, one of our uh, delegation members. And here is here I am with Alexander. Just love that kid. Here, we just came into an area that was hard hit by hurricanes in November, last November. So what have we got? 
We've got troika of tyranny sanctions against Nicaragua. We've got a, pan, a global pandemic, which they did very well. Even people who say that their, that their uh, COVID deaths are 10 times what they're saying, which I, of course the opposition will say things like that. Even that makes it a whole lot better than countries that we know very well because we're living in it. Uh, this was after two hurricanes, a category four followed two weeks later by a category five that hit the north coast, the northeast coast, which is the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua. And you can see those little black dots up there are, are vultures, you know, there's vultures all over the world, but they're sort of significant on this. Um, here's where we landed and some of the people came to greet us. Here you can see some of the devastation. And this is what November, December, January, February, March, you know, three or four months later, and they've done a lot of cleaning up. If you can see this roof, um, the government immediately sent roofing materials so that people could have a roof over their heads, which again, the contrast to the United States and, and the homeless where we give them, you know, where people, not the government, um, donate tents for the homeless. That's how, you know, that, that's about as good as it gets. Um, whoops, went backwards. This, you can see the roof gone from the church, um, but, and, and then here's a, I don't know, I just love the colorful clothes. I, I like places that have clothes hanging out on the lines. And you see a couple of cows. Um, this place was a different place. It wasn't quite as hard hit by the hurricane. Um, this was a, a health center that, a tiny little health center in a tiny little town um, shows the importance of health. This is the school, Centro Escolar Wawabar. Wawabar is the name of the, um, of the town and, and school center. But you can see how that was of all these, you know, I showed you these other um, buildings. What did they do first? The school. And here's the indoor where um, somebody gave us a talk about the school. And it was interesting, they, they're, many of them are bilingual and their bilingual is Mosquito, which is the language, the indigenous language, which they have textbooks in, bilingual textbooks in that, in Spanish. And then some of them also have some have some English, but uh, so they're bilingual and they teach their schools bilingual in Mosquito and um, in Spanish. And the last one here is the the T-shirt, the the back of the T-shirt of the man who, who was uh, gave us the talk in the school. Every success begins with the decision to intend it. So that little. Quote, we'll end with that and I'll see if I can get myself out of here. Um, okay, I think I'm back. Um, so I wanted to show you my t-shirt uh, and let's see. Can you see it? Friends of the ATC. And on the back, I'm not sure whether I'll line this up right, but it says, Let's globalize the struggle and let's globalize the hope. And lucha, sometimes they translate as fight. It's actually a better struggle is a better word. It's like, you know, it, like uh, somebody in Venezuela once after, shortly after Chavez was elected, he'd been an activist for 40 years. And I asked him, how could you keep going? And he said, I can lucha, you know, which is you have to struggle. You know, and so I, that goes into my mind often when I think about, you know, when one new disappointment comes up and you go, ay, 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 it's like, hay que luchar. You know, the thing is, that's our job. Hay que luchar for, toward the world we want, not toward the world we don't want, just keep going toward the world that we want. Now, um, so I wanna talk about a whole bunch of things, but basically, what do what does Nicaragua want? What do the countries in Latin America and around the world want? Sovereignty. 
They want sovereignty. They want that from our government and they actually want us that from us as individuals to know that they will make their decisions. Um, they don't want sanctions. They don't want colonialism. They don't want imperialism. And they don't want what everybody there knows is neoliberalism. And a lot of people in the US don't know what that means. That just, and it basically means that everything is owned privately and, um, the, and the benefits don't matter is what neoliberalism is. You sell out the benefits so that some people get rich and, and more and more money in private hands. Um, something that comes up that, that's an example of where individual activists in solidarity with Nicaragua, it's like if they build a canal or not, guess whose decision that is? That's Nicaragua's decision. Whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, whether they should do it or shouldn't do it, the decision is made by um, Nicaragua. They were actually thinking of doing a, a Sandino in the early 1900s was uh, one who was an advocate of, of there being a canal that was before the Panama Canal was built, um, that it would have been a little, you know, it would have been uh, a quicker route um, to go through Nicaragua than, than Panama. Now the revolution, so some of the big lessons about revolutions that you learn, whether it's Cuba or Venezuela or um, Nicaragua, and yes, I've just named the Troika of Tyranny, according to John Bolton of Trump's administration. And by the way, there are no signs that Biden is reducing any of those ramped up sanctions that uh, Trump put in, which the first hundred days would not have, you know, would be plenty of time to stop those things. They were like those executive orders. Um, so Nicaragua, um, I was interested in thinking about Nicaragua and Venezuela and some of the differences there. Um, Nicaragua has a bit of an advantage in a couple of ways over Venezuela in that um, Venezuela, the neoliberalist part, um, time was 22 years ago in Venezuela. In other words, 1990, Eight was when um, Hugo Chavez was elected. So it's so then he became president in 1999. So that was like 22 years ago. So anybody that's 20, you know, in their 20s, they were just little kids if even born. Um, whereas in Nicaragua, they had a taste of what neoliberalism is as short a time ago as 14 years, because that's when uh, Daniel Ortega came back. Um, Venezuela has a bit of an advantage because it is able to uh, disseminate um, its news. Like there's venezuelaanalysis.com that is my go-to website for whenever a new lie or exaggeration comes up about Venezuela, I go to a venezuelaanalysis.com, 1A in the middle, um, and find out what the story is behind what the mainstream media and our government will want us to, to tell. Um, the revolution, la revolución continua, um, we can see how that happened in Bolivia. They took out Evo Morales, and in order to um, not get killed, he went, uh, he went out of the country, but they got their country back just recently in, in their recent elections. They're back on track with the revolution. Um, to some extent, uh, Argentina, that's happened to some extent, uh, and it'll, today we're hoping for it to happen in Ecuador. Um, and uh, Brazil, they finally um, let Lula off the hook in terms of the accusations that they made of him and in a very, very uh, bad way took out his, his successor, which was Dilma Rousseff, the president of Brazil. Um, it, there's a, a documentary called um, The Trial that it shows how incredible these judicial things can happen, but, but the revolution continues and they're not, um, 
They don't go away. Nicaragua is a great example of that. Uh, I mentioned that in 1979, the Sandinistas, Daniel Ortega became the president. And through the 80s, yes. And what happened in the 80s? Who did we have for president here, which was Ronald Reagan? The Iran-Contra affair was where the Contras were a constant pressure on people who had already been um, suffering through years and years of civil war. And the, uh, in 1990, there was an election and the new, um, uh, president, which was the first woman elected in a Latin American country, elected president, Violeta Chamorro, what, who, Chamorro, I think, was very uh, charismatic and promised the people that there would be peace because the U.S. would stop pressuring them if they didn't elect Daniel Ortega. And to the Sandinista surprise, Daniel Ortega lost. And so then they had 16 years of neoliberalism, privatizing, you know, they had a healthcare system, but you couldn't afford the prescriptions, um, the wealth, the rich got richer and the poor got poorer. And then he was elected again in 2006. And so since 2007, he's been the president and there's another election this year. So watch for US um, negative uh, press and interference because there's an election coming. Same thing that's happening in Ecuador and that happened in Bolivia and happens in Venezuela. Um, the uh, one, yeah. So here's how you tell a lie. I was trying to come up with a, like a sort of a vaccination process because there are people of many, many progressives who believe that um, Daniel Ortega was good in the eighties, but he became corrupt and he became a bad guy now. And who knows, he probably was better in the eighties. Um, but in terms of his, um, his presidency since 2007, Many, many, many great things have happened for the people. Um, but so, so when I say this vaccination, this is not even we in the choir, I believe, need to up our resistance to the lies that are told. Um, and so here's how you tell when the bad stuff about a country's government is likely a lie. That is when the US is imposing sanctions on that country, doubt what you hear. When there are no US military bases in that country. When the human rights abuses are being reported by NGOs that are based in the United States or the United Kingdom. When the country has a non-aligned with the US candidate who just won or who is likely to win in an upcoming election. If these things are true, doubt almost everything you hear. Um, the elections, when the elections are accused of fraud, when somebody who's not the US first choice is elected, um, and when the people who are leaving the country tend to be the wealthy as opposed to the impoverished who are desperate. And when you look at the, uh, at the immigration caravans from South America, from Central America particularly, the Nicaraguans are not in those caravans. The Guatemalans, yes. Sal Salvadorians, yes. And the Hondurans, yes. But the Nicaraguans are actually have hope for things being better in their country. They have that Esperanza, globalize the hope on the back of my t-shirt. And they, and they also, and their hope is based on the fact that things have gotten better. So the, what's happening in Latin America are soft coups. It used to be send in the Marines and now they send in you know, the Contras in the, that which were like the Marines um, in the 1980s, but now they send in the student protesters, you know, because we're in favor of student protesters. We were student protesters or are, 
And so the, that happened in Venezuela where it was the student protesters and they are violent. They're not nonviolent protests that happened in Venezuela a few years back and that ha happened in um, Nicaragua two years ago in April, 2019. So, and what they do in the soft coups is charge the leftist head of state with untrue or even if true, totally insignificant um, infractions of some corruptions or something like that. It's amazing because I mean, they're, they're lies, but even, even if they were true, they're such trivial things and yet they get those things across like Lula, for example, um, and his successor Dilma, Dilma Rousseff, whom uh, uh, people said, no, she's not corrupt, but she has people corrupt around her. So boom, she went, so they were managed to get her out. Rafael Correa, who was a beloved and president and is, um, they sent him out of the country. Uh, or he, they accused him, convicted him, and he went out of the country. He went to Belgium. His wife is Belgium, is Bel Belgium, and um, and not, and then did not allow, as in the case of Brazil, Lula or anybody to run in that either him or like his party. They did the same thing. They were trying to do the same thing in Ecuador, but the people were so strong. It's when the people are that strong that they can't. They, you know, the U.S. government and the uh, oligarchies around the world can't get it to happen. Um, what's, one of the things that they like to attack people on are things that are our, our um, soft spots. Do you know, the soft coups, they accuse them of things where we have soft spots like the treatment of women, the treatment of the indigenous, the environment, um, plus the good old standbys of of corruption and then gossip and then character assassination. I mean, can we talk about Julian Assange? You know that, that as I mentioned, there's a Green Sunday tonight about him. Character assassination, that's happened definitely with Daniela Ortega. Um, versus policy. So they'll talk about human rights viol violations, but they don't say these countries are terrible. They're giving their, their people free health care and they're giving their people um, higher education without debt, you know, without cost. They can't say that. They, they can't say, oh, they're building the roads. They can't say they don't allow their people, you know, they do everything they can so that their people do not get killed in hurricanes. Um, you know, I showed you some pictures of those hurricanes. Not one person died. Everybody was evacuated. And that, and a whole lot of way unfortunate, tragic things happened, like cattle that died, hundreds of cattle died. Their crops failed. Their houses were destroyed. Trees that were way big around that had lived through decades of hurricanes came down because they had a category four and a category five within two weeks of each other, boom. Um, and yet no person was killed out of that whole area. And in fact, in the whole of Nicaragua, far fewer, fewer people um, than Honduras, its next door neighbor. So, um, and, you know, and of course the hypocrisy is pretty extreme because we want to say the US is an expert on how to deal with the environment. We have 5% of the population, you know, roughly 5% of the population of the world, and we use roughly 20% of the resources of the world. And we're complaining about everybody else from Nicaragua to uh, China about, how they, about their environmental practices. And we're an expert on elections and democracy. I, I remember going to Ecuador and Bolivia. I've, my, my habit has been to go to places where there's hope you know, where th things are improving for the people because I wanted hope for my own country. I have no desire, a uh, little desire to move out of this country, but, but I belong here. I know this is where I need to be. Um, so elections and democracy. Uh, the US is an expert on human rights. We have homeless people. Um, 
and gender equality? I don't think so. Look at all the legislatures and the heads of state and stuff. I live in a state and country that's never had a female head of state. A whole lot of Latin American countries have. Um, and indigenous rights. So sort of bypass that by um, killing everybody off. And so the, the hypocrisy, and yet the US government and media is able to get these um, criticisms to land on the leaders in other countries, Evo Morales, Daniel Ortega, Nicolas Maduro, uh, Lula, you know, any, uh, Rafael Correa, you know, all of those, get it, 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 uh, it is able to make those charges land on those people who are actually moving in the direction of benefits for the people of their country and uh, in the world, as we could see with Cuba, where they sent people around the, um, uh, around the world to help fight COVID. They exported their doctors, not their weapons, but their doctors. And I hope, wouldn't it be wonderful? I mean, uh, please support the uh, Henry, what's his last name? Henry something brigade about the Cuban doctors getting the Nobel Peace Prize uh, next year. They should have gotten it this year, but uh, please support that. So I wanted to um, say that uh, to talk about some interesting things that I didn't really know about Nicaragua uh, before. And that is that they, a very big strength of theirs, and this is sort of friends of the ATC and the ATC is, stands for the Association de, of Workers. It's like, um, yeah, it's, I forget what C, oh yeah, Campesinos of Trabajadores de, del Campo. So it's the, it, and it's like the uh, landless workers movement and it's, which is a very, very broad movement and very important. Um, and as I said before, it is so important who has the land. Do you know, they know about slavery and um, because they worked on plantations as short a time as just a couple of decades ago. You know, so they, they or their parents and grandparents worked on plantations where they were essentially enslaved um, conditions. And so very, very important that the land gets uh, redistributed. And often as in Venezuela, the government will buy it and, you know, unused land and, and uh, present it particularly to cooperatives which in cooperatives are also happening in, in Nicaragua, even when they're not official, because the whole community is like your family in a way that's, that's, that you can see when you're there that's very different from, from how we live here. Food sovereignty, something like 90% of the food that they eat in Nicaragua, they make in Nicaragua. It's a huge advantage over Venezuela where a lot of people moved away from the, from the uh, countryside into the city after um, the oil was discovered you know, almost a hundred years ago. The, um, and one of the things that they do in order to help people stay in the rural um, farms, small farms, um, is they brought electricity out there. They being the Ortega government, the Sandinistas, brought, out our, um, brought electricity to some 90 some percent of the countryside. They have schools there. Um, they have and schools that they can get to. Uh, and they have um, roads. You know, they've built roads. They didn't use, they never had before a road from Managua to the Caribbean coast and they have that now. Who helped with the credit on that? What country can you guess? Was it the United States? China. No, China. And so the US and its sanctions are, are moving people toward finding other um, countries who will help them. And those countries include China, Russia, Iran. Um, and, and one of the things that uh, China, Greg Grandin, I recently uh, heard something, I, I watched uh, an interview about 
with Greg Grandin, who's a Latin American academic and uh, here in the US. Um, and he pointed out that one thing that China does not do is try to change regime. They actually figure that whoever the people want as their government, that's who they'll work with. And that's one of the reasons why China has been a better partner um, for a lot of countries in uh, Latin America, certainly than the US. Um, an interesting, so the roads and transportation, I tend to, I come from Michigan, which is uh, car heaven. And I tend to um, think that uh, it, it's too strong a, uh, an emphasis on cars, but roads are important. You know, getting from one place to the other is very important. In October, remind me, I'm going to put a bunch of links in the um, chat because there are some things that I can't even touch on. I can't do much more than touch on. And that is when there was two years ago, when in Nicaragua, the violent protests happened with a big help from social media. Um, what, they, what did they do? They set up roadblocks. The protesters put roadblocks. What did that do? That hurt the people in the countryside, in the farmers, the, you know, the campesinos, hurt them from getting supplies, from get, getting food in and getting food out and from medicines and stuff like that. So they knew how to um, make the people suffer. Uh, and um, meanwhile, telling everybody that the police were cracking down and killing people. Meanwhile, they were, as in Venezuela. Um, the, uh, talk about um, evangelicals. I know that a lot of evangelicals have, have, had gone to Latin America. Uh, Reagan was actually one of the first people who realized that that was something that he could do to undermine the leftist uh, governments was to send evangelicals uh, who would line up with the old um, uh, the, uh, authorities. However, something that I just found out is that um, some of the evangelicals are Sandinistas and the hierarchy in some of the Catholic churches supported the, not, the violent protesters of two years ago. And the people were saying, forget you Catholic church. And so some of them then went to the evangelicals and they consider themselves a very Christian country, a very Catholic country, but less Catholic, still Christian. And they, um, so they have their community churches and, and all like that, but they're not under the um, Catholic church because the Catholic, they're not supporting the Catholic church because the Catholic church was not supporting them. And they're like, okay, Goodbye. Now, abortion is an issue that is um, laid that I've, I've heard uh, as an accusation against uh, Daniel Ortega's government. And what happened was that it's uh, one of about six countries, most of them in Central America, that are in this hemisphere where it's banned, where abortion is banned. When did that, when was that law passed? 2006. That's at the time of the election, just before the election that Noriega came, that um, Ortega, sorry, if I've ever said Noriega, I misspoke, that Ortega came back. Um, and so then they put a ban on abortion. But uh, in the slideshow, I showed that little boy, Alexander and his mother. Um, I wanted to find out if, if abortion was possible. And so I asked Susan Lagos, who's a person who's lived in Nicaragua, uh, and a US per citizen who has lived in Nicaragua for about 30 years. And she said, well, I don't know, you should ask her. And, and she pointed to the mother, Silke, Alexander's mother. And I didn't wanna ask her because I thought maybe she'd be upset with me for even suggesting you know, anything about abortion because there she was with her darling little baby. 
no, no, no problem. She, she told me that particularly in the cities, people know where they can terminate a pregnancy if that's what they, if they, if that's what they want to do. Um, it's, a, it's harder in the rural, but, um, but they can go and get a pregnancy from a professional, from a good, uh, you know, they know the clinics where they can go. And what I heard was that although it's illegal, both in uh, Nicaragua and its neighbor Honduras, which some people have called USS Honduras, um, it, that, it's, that it's illegal in both of those countries and in El Salvador, they have, um, Nicaragua has never um, uh, arrested and convicted um, somebody for having an abortion whereas that is not the case in those other countries. And so they, they, will, so they do not pursue, um, there's a word I can't think of, they don't arrest people for, having, for terminating their pregnancies. And my Spanish wasn't quite good enough, but, uh, but what, she, what, I, what she said was that in Cuba where it's legal, one of the few Latin American countries where it is legal with no restrictions, um, then, um, that they have more teenage mothers than they do in Nicaragua. So somehow it's uh, working out. Um, another interesting thing about uh, Nicaragua is that they have this mandate to have 50% of their government, of their government officials be female. Um, and so, and if they have like a mayor, vice mayor or a president, vice president, one of them's male, the other needs to be female. And then when they float candidates, you know, they float 50% female. And so they, and, and they have a problem with domestic violence. Um, and, and that's one of the, the things that they also have is that they have police departments that are all female and a, and a female can go there to talk, to, uh, talk about domestic violence. Um, the, um, oh, there was something that came in, it'll come back in about the, um, women and the, uh, oh, that's another thing. That's it. Evangelicals. I mean, a lot of people know that if you take, um, well, let's say it's a man because it, it, domestic violence, that's off in the direction. You take a man and he's sober. He's one type of guy. You take a man and he's drunk. And that's another type of guy. And so one of the reasons that people are going to evangelicals, some of the evangelical churches, not all of them, but some of them are um, the non, I'm talking about the non-Catholic Christian churches that are there. Um, no drinking is allowed. So a lot of women will go to those churches and try to bring their men in so that the men will stop drinking and stop being this person who does domestic abuse. That reminded me actually, you know, the women in the US getting the, uh, the right to vote in 1919. Uh, in the late 1800s, one of the industries that was very much opposed and put up a lot of money against women getting the right to vote was what industry? Liquor, because they knew that the women wanted to uh, prohibit uh, liquor. And we all know that prohibition was a huge disaster, but, it's, but the problem of liquor and drunkenness and the relationship to violence still exists. And so that's something that is um, being dealt with um, in Nicaragua, partly by having police departments that are all female. Um, I mentioned the hurricanes. Um, there's, it's just about 1127. And so we're just about at one hour. And I'm really looking forward to questions and comments. Um, I do wanna say 
that if anything I ever said makes it sound like Nicaragua or any of the countries in Latin America or their leaders are perfect, then I do not mean to say that they are not perfect. But again, what's important is that they have sovereignty. We, the, the, the OAS, the Organization of American States is known as the enforcer of the Monroe Doctrine. And so if you hear the OAS says this, you know, alleges that there was fraud in this election, please discount that. Um, uh, Costa Rica, a couple of just notes about words, and then I'll wrap as a wrap up. Costa Rica, I heard them say they think it's, it thinks it's a European country. It does not want to identify itself as uh, one of those Central American countries. And um, some people say that it's the Miami of Latin America because a lot of Venezuela squalidos, that's a word that uh, Chavez applied to the very rich, the squalid ones um, in Venezuela, they, go, they, they may go to Costa Rica or they may go to Miami. Um, the war on drugs, a good reason to bring military into a country and that's why Venezuela and so many others say, no, we're not cooperating with you all. Um, American, the fact that, I mean, if you look up in Wikipedia and you, and you look up the demonym uh, for what a person who lives in the United States is, they say it's American, um, but uh, like, but what they call us is Norte Americanos or Estadounidenses, you know, Estado, you know, the, like United Statesians, um, Yankees, gringos. Um, but I honestly, I'll just throw this in that like New York, New Yorkers, US users, I think we should be called users. And then just that should be our, our demo name. Um, da, da, da. Yeah, so I'll uh, wrap it up with that. And the word, the word that we need to know about Latin America and what they want is sovereignty. So thank you. And I'm looking forward to the questions and comments. Thank you so much, Laura, for framing it that way and for giving so many important details and images that we can take away from this. We could go on. I'm sure you could go on a long time and we could go on a long time discussing all of this. But I, we're going to start with people raising their hands and um, let me see, I have to get into gallery view so I can see. If you, if you can raise your, put up the hand signal, that would be good, but I will also try to see people ra raising their, their hands like this if you want to. Um, I don't see any hands. I guess people are digesting this. Um, look, I can, uh, oh, there you go, Kim, Kim White. Um, let's see. I have to ask you to unmute. Sorry. Okay. Go can ahead. you hear me? Yes. Yes, we okay. can. Go ahead. Hi, Laura. Thanks for your, your presentation. I wanted to ask you, um, when you were showing the photographs, you mentioned semi-autonomous zones. So could you talk more about that? Yes. Uh, thank you for asking about that. The, um, I was fascinated uh, to learn about that. There's uh, Nicaragua is uh, sort of shaped like a, well, that doesn't matter. Let, it's, it's one of those countries that is both on the, has a Pacific coast and a Caribbean coast. On the Caribbean coast, there's the Northern semi-autonomous zone and the Southern semi-autonomous zone. And we went to both of them. Where that terrible hurricane devastation was, was the Northern um, semi-autonomous zone. And the people who are there are a lot of um, Afro-descendant and indigenous people. Um, both are there. And I mentioned the mosquito language that they have textbooks in and that um, they're bilingual in, and there are some other languages as well. So an example, um, you, could, you could actually, oh, who did that? 
I'm not sure. I don't think I have that one. No. The, um, here's an example. They have healthcare systems and they, the, the country of Nicaragua has a healthcare system. And what it is, um, is exemplified by a sign that was in a big hospital that says, all services are free. If anybody asks you for money, report it. <laughs> okay, so they have that and they have, like I showed you that tiny little healthcare center, but they have healthcare centers around the country. Also, the semi-autonomous zone has their own um, health care system. And often that's where like they'll have their birth centers. But there is a hospital that's nearby, you know, that that is that that can that the mother the, that giving birth can go to if they run into problems. But they can start out with not the Nicaraguan National Health Care Service, but their own health care service. So that's healthcare. Another thing is I mentioned about the um, the schools being bilingual. And a, a third thing that um, I'll mention is the justice system. That there are times when they when somebody will do something and um, something criminal, and the semi-autonomous zone will say, "We're deciding that. We're working on that. This is not." a case for the state of Nicaragua to deal with, even if it is like a federal or state crime. Um, we'll deal with that, and why? Because they want to bring the person and the person's family back into the community. They don't want to go send, you know, send him to jail, him or her to jail, away from the family, hurt the family and all of that. So, they, so what would that be called? Restorative justice but they wanna do their own kind of justice. And so they have that autonomy to do that. The government doesn't, I mean, remember the times when California was saying, okay, it's legal, you know, medical marijuana is legal and all of that. And I think it was during Obama years, you know, what, what were these helicopters doing flying over Santa Cruz looking for marijuana being grown? You know, it's not your business. Um, and so, so, so there are things like that, that um, they have there in some of their own uh, ways of organizing their um, municipalities and their governments and things like that. And so it, it's really fascinating. At the end of the trip, there was an optional add-on to go to Corn Island, which I'd never heard of before, which is in the Southern semi-autonomous region. And um, that's where we went snorkeling and we saw some sand sharks and these wonderful fish and stuff and, and had the second best fish I'd ever had in my life. Because the first one was when I showed you where, where uh, Brian Wilson was at that restaurant. Uh, anyway, uh, they, they, uh, we, we went there and there, and they speak Creole. We, we were just getting into Spanish at the end of the delegation. Blah, blah, blah. We're talking Spanish. They don't speak Spanish. They were speaking Creole and some other indigenous language and stuff. And so they have their, you know, uh, own uh, ways of, of doing things. And it's not uh, coerced into doing things in a different way. So I hope that answers. Yeah, that, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the, and the, larger regional government doesn't uh, doesn't infiltrate or doesn't um, disturb the semi-autonomous zones. Right, and after the hurricane sent roofing material so that everybody would have a roof over their head, that was central government, you know, and, and, uh, and, and built a road, which was a very difficult thing in the past 10 or 15 years, maybe less a road from Managua to there. Other than that, it, you'd have to fly, you'd have to whatever, but you know, you get a road and then you know, you're connected. And tourism, as I think I mentioned, in so many countries, you know, we've got the rich countries and we've got the countries where the rich people go to be tourists. Um, and it's very important. And so when they sanction these countries and cut down on the tourism business, that's a huge problem. But the Caribbean coast is a great place to go tour, you know, as a tourist. 
um, and the Corn Island is really cool. It's a tropical island, you know, Caribbean island. Okay, um, I made a mistake and did not do what we're what we usually do, which is take a break and have some announcements. But I'm I see two hands now, so let's let me call on Mehmet and then Richard W. and then we'll take that break. So Mehmet. Yes. Uh, thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Laura. Great presentation. Uh, really uh, enjoyed it a lot. Uh, when we were there, I was very surprised to find, and you mentioned just the, in passing a canal that was being built, uh, maybe parallel to the Panama Canal. What is the situation of it? And I, it looks like there was some work going on it, and it was uh, maybe a bypassing of the Panama Canal and the control over it. And the, like you said, the Chinese were investing in it. So what is the situation of that? And would that give... Nicaragua more independence and sovereignty. What do you think? Thank you. The um, it would probably help them economically, uh, and it's something that, as I mentioned, Sandino even was talking about a hundred years ago. And it's I don't I think that it's still something that is being discussed that hasn't really, um, to my knowledge, it hasn't been decided in other words i don't know um i think it's just being discussed i don't think that it's it's totally planned as of yet but um they have a you know they have the possibility of doing it that's one of those things then whenever you build a road whenever you build a canal whenever you build anything there's an effect on the environment and so that's uh that's something that of course you know the is important and that the US government and media who don't care if we use a precious resource of water in order to bring oil out of the ground would um, suddenly care about the environment somewhere. But yeah, so I don't know, that's something you, uh, to look up. Okay, Richard. Yeah, originally I was gonna uh, uh, address the, the question about the autonomous zone um, and I'll still address that. I, first, first off, um, uh, when I was there two weeks after Reagan was reelected, uh, and uh, it was interesting to say the least. Uh, but at that time, there were no there were no roads out to the uh, to the Caribbean side of of uh, outside of uh, get, you know you couldn't go from Managua to the Caribbean side. And what that had the effect of doing was it made. It made the uh, the Atlantic side of Nicaragua very susceptible to the uh, to the Contras, and later on uh, to the uh, Ray Contras, especially up in the northern area. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, I, th I think it also uh, facilitated uh, a lot of U.S. investors were going down there and trying to uh, trying to put their imprint on Nicaraguan uh, affairs uh, by virtue of the isolation of those areas. Um, and so yeah, she, uh, I, um, you know, Laura said that she traveled by road. I think that was, that, that's only like the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, um, the other thing is, is that, uh, man, about the, uh, the canal, uh, when I, when I was, uh, last time I, I looked into it, it was sort of on hold, uh, pending environmental, uh, impact statements. Uh, the Chinese have, have uh, have ponied up the money to to buy land to uh, uh, they, they've got like an, an infrastructure development uh, uh, firm in place uh, and like I said it's 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 pending uh, um, uh, that there's a route that goes down a, a little river roughly uh, and that's the proposed route but they're looking into the environmental impacts of it uh, the the person that's on here who would probably be a lot more of an expert than I is a hobby. Um, but uh, anyways, I'll show, oh, I, I did want to, you did mention that you're up on the Mosquito Coast, uh, and there were some reports of a couple of years ago about the Ray Contras. Did you hear anything about uh, the Ray Contras uh, in that in that area? The Ray Contras? Yeah, yeah, they, they were the Contras that were, uh, they, they were the Ray Contras. <laughs> we had the you know, back in the uh, back in the uh, you know the Reagan era, you had the Contras that were uh, that were uh, 
you know, messing up with, you know, they were, they were doing a lot of bad things. They were supported by the U.S. and uh, by the Reagan administration. Uh, and uh, they were uh, like, they were, uh, I, uh, anyways, uh, but they but they, they you, you hadn't heard. Okay. I just wondered if you'd, if you'd heard anything more about them. No, okay. I, I'll, sh I'll shut up and, and uh, get back to the schedule. Well, no, thank you. Um, and actually we flew um, in little prop planes. Uh -huh. um, we, we drove up to Esteli, which is where the farm was that I showed you. Yeah. Um, and then we drove down, down to Granada, which is where the, um, the islands and the monkey and stuff were. Yeah. Um, but we flew to both the Bilwi and Wawabar in the Northern Autonomous Zone. And we flew also to the Corn Islands in little prop, uh, prop planes that perfectly fine, yeah. Okay, let's, let's take that break right now and then we'll get back to the discussion. Uh, I'm gonna call on Eugene and then on Richard Fallenbaum. Go ahead, Gene. Yes, <clears throat> well, thank you very much. And this is, I uh, wanna keep it brief. So uh, on the next week, we have Law and People's Rights in India with Mihir Desai. Um, and following that, we have, um, uh, Grover Fur speaking on issues in Soviet history. So that should be very interesting. Uh, I don't know if Raj wants to say something about next week's. Uh, Raj, yes, uh, thank out. you. Gene. Yeah, very quickly, Mir Desai is uh, a attorney for civil rights in India and practices in Mumbai uh, High Court as well as the Supreme Court of India and is a very renowned uh, attorney. Uh, and uh, he's been handling some very high and highly uh, sensitive cases, uh, you know, and in view of the emerging form of uh, rule in India, which uh, is neo-fascist, uh, there is a threat to uh, civil liberties and people, ordinary people who view, uh, who become known uh, publicly, public intellectuals are being attacked and put in jail selectively of so far it's not mass but it's very important issue Mir is uh, is taking it is courageous and he will be uh, he's well known and he's a courageous person and he'll be speaking on that issue it should be very informative so um, thank you okay thank you Raj I see he was also legal counsel for the international T T tribunal on Kashmir which uh, very problematic area. So we're looking forward yeah. to that. And if you need to know more information on our schedule or anything else, go to our website, icssmarks.org. So um, back to you, Sharon or, or Richard. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Richard. Oh, I have to ask you to unmute, sorry. Thank you. Um, this is the funds part of our program. We're still collecting funds for our own uh, expenses and for support of the uh, Nebo Proctor Marxist Library in Oakland, which is our um, physical and spiritual home. Um, I, play, I posted uh, on the chat some information on how you can contribute either by PayPal or check or now Patreon. Um, and please contact me if you have some other needs in, in terms of contributing. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's in the chat, everyone. The, the, um, the information is in the chat. Also, Laura put a bunch of, um, of, of some links in there and also the announcement for this evening's Green Sunday. Laura, you have your hand up, so go ahead. I just wanted to say that um, Kim White, who is here and asked the question about the semi-autonomous zones, um, is going to be um, one of our presenters at the Green Sunday tonight. And I did put the link in, uh, in the chat, along with a whole bunch of other links for more information about things. Thank you. So um, uh, next up is Norma.
the, it needs to be mentioned that uh, the United States tried to create a uh, an oppositional kind of behavior by the mosquito, uh, representing that they were causing problems against the Ortega government. Maybe you want to talk about that a little bit. Um, so you, how did you put it again, Norma? That, that, that the mosquito were being made into an enemy of the uh, Ortega, revo uh, as, as it were, revolution. And uh, that that's a, an, a, a basic tactic that, the, that imperialism employs to conquer any uprisings in favor of the populace. And uh, that, that it was a, uh, a device created by the U.S. and uh, whoever went along with it. Yeah, thank you. Um, and the that is always, uh, you know, it reminds me of in the U.S. where they realized, um, you know, where, where they the Nixon plan and other plans of getting the solid South to um, go for Nixon and then later Trump and all of that by tying in the uh, fundamentalist Christian movement with their, um, you know, keep the rich rich movement. So, but, uh, and that has, that definitely happened. That happened during, before Ortega was president, you know, when, during the Sandinista revolution in the leading up to 1979, um, and then uh, it happens still. And there are people who have different, uh, you know, who uh, want to choose a leader that are different from the logic that we would think that they would, would choose for whatever reasons. And it, it happens and it's hard to, uh, to understand all of that. But one of the things that what you're saying reminds me of is that the, Two years ago, when there was the uh, uh, uprising of the violent protesters, the um, and they kept saying that the police were killing people. They were killing people, and in fact, what happened was that the that Ortega did not want to blow up the country into a civil war, and he held the police back for a while. He did not want to to um, feed into that kind of thing that the social media was trying to wrap up, ramp up. And what the um, people, however, had had their experience of how the police were. And they knew that the police were from the community. They were from you know, the people themselves. And they realized that it didn't make sense and so while there was a whole lot of, of confusion at first, um, they realized that, that it wasn't true and that those roadblocks that were set up, they went out and started dismantling them. And some people were killed by the violent protesters while they were dismantling what they called the trunkes, which is the, the roadblocks. And while that this doesn't exactly answer your question, but it's that kind of thing where, um, where uh, most of the people, if they're actually given a chance to uh, have a fair election as in Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, um, Nicaragua, they do know who's on their side. You know, they can get that. And so even, uh, so that, that is why, I mean, Maduro, not a perfect person, nor was Chavez, nor Ortega, anybody. Um, but why Maduro is still in office after eight years of constant pressure because people know at least what he is trying to do and they see the new housing. And that's true in, in Nicaragua as well. And the, they see the roofs coming, they see you know, the help that comes, they see that in, in Honduras, um, it, it, there was a, a show ab about the comparison between Honduras and, um, 
and Nicaragua and how they dealt with the category four and category five hurricanes last November. And in Honduras, not only did they not evacuate people, they, th when the people themselves found private boats to come and get them off the rooftops, um, then uh, they went out to see if those boats were licensed. You know, so they were in the exact opposite direction. And people are not stupid. If, if they're given good choices, one, one is on their side and the other is not, they will um, do what, as I've repeated over and over, has happened and we hope will happen today in Ecuador. They, they'll go toward the ones that are on their side. That thing about Ecuador is really difficult to sort out because, uh, you know, DSA has been reading the thing about the extractivist society and finding that without it, they have nothing. Well, it's like the United States. If, if the United States didn't have war, it would have no economy. Yeah, an, an interesting thing in, uh, you know, they had an indigenous environmentalist, supposedly, who... Um, uh, ya Yaki Perez, um, who had changed his name from Carlos. He was known as Carlos Perez, and then to be more indigenous sounding, he became Yaki Perez. And they call him, and some people call him Yankee Perez, um, because he's on the side of the US uh, interventionists. But he comes out, I'm indigenous, I'm you know, environmental and stuff. Not at all true. He, he was the third, um, Con the, the, got the third most uh, votes in the initial presidential election, which now today is the runoff between the top two vote getters. Um, but they called him Yankee Perez, which I thought was Thanks. telling. We have two more people on the stack, Raj and then Alan. Oh, Go ahead, I have, Alan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Laura, for an excellent presentation. I really uh, learned a lot from, uh, uh, from your presentation about Nicaragua uh, uh, and Latin America in general. So thanks for your work and, and your presentation, both. Uh, one question that, you know, ever since Carter, uh, the United States established this human rights as a way of interfering and in fact overthrowing legitimately elected, uh, popularly supported governments all around the world. And somehow American people are uh, by that appeal of uh, human rights. And, uh, and then as you have explained, if uh, Daniel Ortega and, and other president of Latin America are not perfect, uh, then they are required to be perfect, but we have imperfect presidents and, and there is no problem with that. I mean, perfect human beings don't exist. So the question is, I have is, is uh, sovereignty, respecting sovereignty sufficient to appeal uh, here in the United States? Because most people are very, become very sensitive to human rights. And uh, in, but in the, the, under the guise of human rights, the greatest violation of human rights is done by United States. So how do you, do you have any thoughts on that? I would like to hear, um, should, is that sufficient or if not sufficient, what more should be done to bring people onto the side of social justice, which is global, you know, globally encompassing um, that, that I would like to know what you think. Thank you, and thank you for okay. your presentation. Yeah, thank you for that question. And sanctions, as as you may know, are illegal. They're they're prohibited by the United Nations Charter, and they are and actually should be called unilateral coercive measures. So those are are prohibited that one country would do by itself unilateral coercive measures against another country in order to effect what 
um, the U.S. calls regimes and authoritarians and tyrants and you know strongmen and stuff like that, and so those that kind of sanction is is illegal. Now, don't leave it up to an individual country to decide. So my you know what I would say is. We don't want to leave it up to an ind individual country to decide where there are human rights abuses and where there are not. Now, the people themselves, a boycott like the great void boycott way back when of the United Farm Workers or a boycott of um, South America, you know, the uh, uh, South Africa, excuse me, um, those kinds of popular uh, people's boycotts are a different thing where the state is not imposing that. And those are things that are BDS, you know, those are things that people can have as individuals and in solidarity can have an effect on our world. But what I would say is go to the UN and forget the Security Council. I like what Edward, um, Eduardo Galeano of Uruguay who wrote Upside Down World very well put, um, said is that look at the Security Council of the United Nations. Let's take the biggest weapons manufacturing countries in the world and put them in charge of our security and see how well that works. So get rid of that, but look at the General Assembly of the United Nations. And if they come up with sanctions, then possibly, you know, that's the only, you know, possible way of a, having an official kind of sanction, I think. Um, and what would, the, what would the General Assembly of the United Nations say? They would say what they have said. I think is it only the U.S. and Israel that has voted against um, stopping this outrageous, ludicrous, impossible 60-year um, blockade against Cuba. 60 years. I mean, even if you were only, uh, only looked at it with the logic of did it achieve what you wanted and said no, even with that logic of the fact that there has not been a regime change. And yes, in fact, I remember when I, I went to Cuba, I've been there only once, I'd love to go back. Um, the And people would say, yeah, well, what's going to happen with Cuba after the Castro's? Oh, gee, I wonder if they've thought about that. You know, um, it's, it's like this ability to think that they haven't thought about such a thing. Do you know what's going to happen after the Castro's? As if the whole thing is just the Castro's. No, it's the people of Cuba. That's what the revolution is. So I would say, forget the OAS, because that's um, the enforcer of the Monroe Doc Doctrine, Organization of the American States, OAS. Forget NATO. Trying to, to get NATO strong again is white, supre white supremacy on a global scale. Trying to keep Europe and the US um, and trying to, keep, trying to enforce white, white supremacy, get that back. So forget those kind of organizations and see what the General Assembly of the United Nations would consider there to be human rights abuses because there certainly are in the world and it would be nice to have there be a, to have there be a way of dealing with it. There's also, what is it called? The International Court, World Court. I, I forget the name. It's something that, that the US helped to start and ignores anytime they come up with a judgment uh, about the US's behavior it's the international court, something. Um, uh, and, uh, empower that, you know, that's what I would say about sanctions, but drop the 30 some sanctions that the US has done around the world, which by the way, even if it's the logic of uh, selfish logic is not working for the US, it is driving people, it is, creating a multipolar world instead of a unipolar world because these countries are needing to go to someplace else other than the big daddy up north. Over. Thank you.
Okay, I'm going to call on Alan and then on myself. Go ahead, Alan. Hi, Laura. Thank you for your presentation. Really informative. Um, I know you touched on this in a uh, during your presentation and, and a few questions, but can you briefly talk about the demonstration, the wave of demonstrations that swept through Nicaragua a few years ago, and in particular comment on the aftermath, what the effects um, after these demonstrations, what's going on today related to that? Yes, and that's one of the things that you'll um, find in the chat. I think it might have been uh, uprising or coup um, at 1144, where Chuck Kaufman of the Alliance for Global Justice. Oh, and I think I forgot to mention, although it was mentioned within the announcement, that the the uh, sponsors of the delegation included the Alliance for Global Justice, as well as Sanctions Kill and Code Pink, and as a, you know, the friends of the um, ATC, of the uh, workers from the uh, Campesinos workers. Um, but basically what happened was, oh, I forget the number, but it was zillions of social media messages, a big blitz of them started coming out. And um, the people were, there were, and students and some people were paid um, to, to go to take to the streets and to be in the marches and all of that. And it happened just suddenly. There it was, and social media coming from everywhere where, where they've learned how to um, manipulate, you know, as we've heard about uh, Cambridge Analytics and, you know, all of those things. Um, the way unfortunate thing, in my view, is that these things that could be available to those of us you know, that don't have tons of money, you know, the activists for a better world don't have tons of money. Well, guess what? They're available to the people who do have tons of money and they have even more resources in order to use them to uh, spread the word. But so there were a whole bunch of messages. People started getting this. They started hearing that the police were out in the streets. They were killing people. They were, um, you know, that there were these people who, had a concern about social security. I should mention that, that that's what they used as the hook. Um, the social security system that was inherited um, at, from the neoliberal period that ended in 2006, so 15 years ago, it was running into trouble. And so they had the opposite, you'll, you'll learn about this if you go to these links, but the opposition was at the table and a whole bunch of people were at the table, business, government, you know, with, with uh, Ortega to figure out who, how to deal with the social security system. So what they decided was that they would increase the amount that they were taking out of individuals by 1% they would increase the amount that they were taking out from the employers, the employing companies by 3%. The, um, and they were, I can't remember whether they decided to or not to lower the, or, or raise, I'm sorry, raise the retirement age at which you started getting benefits. I, I remember that was being discussed and I can't remember which way it went. So they said that because of that, they, the students were in the streets because they felt bad for their parents and grandparents and things like that, which you know, could be legitimate. So then, um, so they left the table, they left the negotiations. And in order to get the social security system back on track, then this regulation was passed the protests happened. And then at some point, a day or two later, um, Ortega pulled the regulation, said, okay, we won't do this back to the drawing board. We'll figure something out. And they kept going. The opposition kept going. So they used this um, 
something that they could have stayed at the table and negotiated and worked on, but they didn't want themselves to get an increase in tax. And so then they pull out social media, they get, pe they, they get people to go to the streets, they put out these roadblocks, they kill a couple of police were killed. I mean, how often and in a nonviolent protest do police get killed um, and, uh, and create this huge confusion? Now you ask about, uh, and, and so then the, uh, the police were actually prevented from going out, as I mentioned, because of the, not wanting to start a civil war. And then um, the people themselves went out to open up the roadblocks to take down the trunkes, and some of them were killed. And then you were asking about the aftermath. So I was, the roads were all clear. Um, everything was functioning. There was still um, Danielle Nova, uh, Dan Danielle Continua. There's a big um, habit in many countries in Latin America where they call people by their first name. It's like Fidel, Raul, you know, in Cuba and Danielle, so they're, they're more likely to call him Danielle than, than Ortega. Um, and it looks like he's um, on his two things, elections coming up, I believe in November. And when, uh, so two things are happening so far, it looks like he's ahead, like he's going to win. They're not sure um, who's going to run against them. And the US has been involved in trying to get them to settle on one opponent so that they don't, um, uh, you know, split their vote. And the, uh, but they haven't got the candidate set up yet. Ortega, I didn't mention this yet. The current vice president is a female, as a matter of fact, is the first lady. And that's his wife has been the vice president. Everybody says, that that's a bigger controversy. People say it's a bigger controversy outside the country than it is inside the country because she's really efficient, very hardworking, keeps people up to date and all of that. But, they, but they're not gonna run her again, but it'll be a woman. Um, so the aftermath is that he's still got the support of his people. I didn't feel any, you know, I didn't see very many police. I mostly, I live in Oakland, California. That's where I see the most of the police I see. Um, and uh, it seemed like it was pretty much back business uh, as usual. So um, the, the people are still um, with the revolution. And I want to uh, say this, say, say something that I'm not sure I said this before, but during the 16 years that the Sandinistas were out of power, the revolution continued. As you know, they kept organizing, they kept creating better lives for people, even if they weren't in power. And so that's sort of the same thing that's happening. They're still working on, they keep their eyes on the prize, better lives for people. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'm going to call on myself. Uh, thank you for framing this as what, does it, what do people want in countries around the world? They want sovereignty. They want the US boot off their necks. And um, I've been around a long time. And it makes me sad that we've been trying for so long to change US foreign policy. And we haven't really gotten very, with, very far, despite the fact that we played a role in stopping the war in, um, in Vietnam. We, the peace movement is given in general much too much credit, gives itself much more, too much credit for having done that. In fact, it was the Vietnamese who defeated the United States. But what I, was, what I hope is that we, in the we progressives can take a step back and look at the peace and solidarity movements that we've tried to build all these years and be self-critical or think about what we could do better. I mean, I'm glad that you mentioned all the sponsoring groups that you, that you were with and they're, 
I mean, a lot of people are doing very, very good work in terms of analysis and trying to communicate what the facts are, but still we haven't reached the American people and uh, in general. And, and so I think it would be helpful for us to try to look at new ways of uh, building solidarity and getting, getting the American people to think about what it means to be working class inside the belly of the beast, inside the, the imperial state. And um, just wanna mention that today in the New York Times Magazine, there is an article by Marcella Valdez about, it starts, it's titled about TPS, Temporary Protective Status, and the court case that was filed by two women who actually live near us. They live in San Pablo, which is right up the road from Oakland. And it's a beautiful article because she actually gets talks about the, the history of Central America and US um, domination there. And I, I haven't seen that in print in any mainstream media in a very long time. So I read it once online and I'm looking forward to reading the, the magazine today. I recommend that. Um, but anyway, I think we need to frame what we're talking about in those broader terms. Yeah, thank you. I, amen. <laughs> Just, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, next is Anne and then Jean. Go ahead, Anne. Oh, okay. Hi, um, thank you so much, Laura. Um, so my my question is kind of on a different subject and it may be that kind of question of solidarity and how do we build things. And one of the things that I know about Nicaragua and I don't know very much, but I do know that they've had a resurgence in the labor movement there. And that in fact, um, you know, that they're maybe the only Central American country that hasn't imprisoned or killed a, a, a labor organizer in, at least um, since the return. Um, I, one of the, the other things that I was really interested in is the organization of the informal um, economy that they've been working with. And I was just wondering if you knew anything about that and how they're managing to do that. Um, the, yeah, the informal economy I'm glad you asked that question because I, I um, meant to say something about the pandemic. Um, the informal, it's something like 80 or 90% of people um, work in our, our private enterprises or they work for themselves or their family. In other words, there are a lot of um, open air stalls and carts and things like that, that people um, uh, have. And so the, uh, and, and, and not to mention the small farms, you know, and, and often they're related, you know, that they have small farms and then they sell their, their produce in a, in a stand or, um, or a cart. And, and they do have some, by the way, export crops, which they need in order to get, uh, you know, to help their economy. And so they do have coffee and they have cigars and, um, and other, uh, other, you know, other produce and things like that, that are, that are um, for export. And so the the Friends of the ATC, which is the Association of the uh, uh, Workers from the Countryside. Um, I don't have the exact translation in my head, but they, uh, they along with the ATC itself, the Friends of are in support of them and the ATC. So they, they're very strong and they go to the, to the, 
so I'm talking about the countryside right now, that they go there, they go to the farms, they help them with best practices. Agroecology is what they're focused on so that it's, so that it's agricultural and it's ecological. They'd have very few agribusiness um, like Mexico got, you know, after NAFTA, a whole lot of the private farms, bye-bye. And, and, uh, and then they couldn't even compete with uh, Iowa corn in their local markets. Um, so that has not happened. Um, it's in terms of, so, so I know that that's really strong. Um, and in terms of the other uh, informal economy organizing, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, like, you know, they, I see, you know, they have everything from swimsuits to housewares to hardwares, you know, and, and I, and so I don't know that, but I did want to mention the COVID thing that they, I think I mentioned that they have good statistics, good results. And one of the reasons is they spend a lot of time outside, but they also never had a quarantine, never locked down because they're shelter in place because people would have died. You know, they could not do that. They cannot be at home and sell their wares at an outdoor stand. And uh, so, and they didn't shut down their schools, their, their schools as at the hurricane section, uh, the hurricane devastation, devastated area, uh, where they get their schools back first. Their schools are so important. They really, it's not just lip service. Um, and so they didn't shut all of that down. Now, um, yeah. I wish I, I wish I knew more about how they're organizing the informal economy, but I don't. Thank you for the question. Thank you, um, Jean. You're next. Okay. Well, 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 thank you so much again. Um, as I said, I don't know too much about Latin America, but the things that you say certainly enrich my understanding. Um, and again, uh, the importance of Latin America in, in the global struggle against U.S. imperialism, I think, is needs to be stressed. Um, and I think that uh, the Americas know what imperialism is, and they've experienced that. And on this, I appreciate your comments um, you made about China's role in this, that China is not only the largest, has become the largest trading partner of most uh, Latin American countries, um, as well as most countries around the world, but now is a larger country uh, economically than the United States in many respects and according to some measures. <clears throat> but, um, you know, I, I think people, and the role that China has played has been generally progressive and anti-imperialist in this regard. And I think a lot of people on the left don't really understand it. They tend to side with the uh, counter-revolutionaries against, against China. Um, but particularly, I, I think your comments about how, um, you know, Chinese relationships, they have a lot of trade and so forth, they do a lot of projects, but they always respect the sovereignty of the people um, of that country. They don't go in for this kind of regime change that we do uh, in the United States. And on this, I just want to mention, you know, for the first time, the United States is face to face with a powerful economic system that has nuclear weapons. Because back in 1950s, Mao looked at you know, the American threat, threats to nuke China over Vietnam, over Korea, uh, and China itself. And Mao decided, well, if we, wanna, if we don't want them to bully us, we need to have this thing. So they got their nuclear weapons, but they pledge, and they have the only country that has pledged, they will never be the first to use nuclear weapons, and they will not use nuclear weapons against a uh, non-nuclear uh, power. So I, I just think um, we need to see this global struggle and understand, you know, Latin America, Africa, China are all basically on the same side in terms of the anti-imperialist struggle. I just wanted to, and thank you for your comments on that because I uh, clarified some of the points I was, yeah. we, thanks. Um, just I, uh, just to, to say something here that I just put um, in the chat, 
another link that I have that relates to the violent protesters from two years ago. So there was the one that was at 1144 with uh, Chuck Kaufman of the Alliance for Global Justice. And then there's one that I just put in at, at 1219 that says revisiting, I don't know, I'm confused here. When was that? Um, I don't know whether, <laughs> okay, check it out. It might or might not help. Um, but yeah, the multipolar world, the U.S., what, what the, how the U.S. is behaving now with the sanctions and all of that is backfiring. Um, and it's in, in some ways, and I knew that I know this was true in Venezuela, whatever they were trying in Venezuela, it kept backfiring and made Hugo Chavez's government stronger when they did a coup. The people took their government back by flooding the streets, they, then they were stronger. Then they tried an economic blockade of the bosses lock, locked out people. And then guess what? They found out they fired themselves. The executives fired themselves and the Chavez government got more control of the money in order to spread it out to among the people. Then they tried the recall, which was something from the new constitution and they beat that back and every step made Venezuela stronger. Um, that was back in the 2002 to 2006 or seven period seven or eight. Um, and so now what's happening is that it, it, the U.S. is driving countries into the alignment with uh, China, Russia, Iran, you know, other countries. And Latin America, one of the best things that Hugo Chavez did, and he, he would sometimes people say, well, he should spend more time in Venezuela and less time in other countries. No, he knew from history. He taught history in the military and it was great that he was in the military because the military stayed on, on his side mostly. Um, but he knew that a country by itself could not stand up against the North Americanos, you know, the, the Im imperial power to the North. And so he went around and created these linkages in healthcare, in resource utilization, in uh, it's surgeries for the blind with Cuba, obviously with the, with the doctors, in um, trade, in, did I mention communications, you know, in all of these areas, governance, you know, he knew that he needed to link up ALBA, um, the Alliance or whatever, you know, but he, and the Caribbean. Uh, and so all of those things were, have been moving along in the past 20 years. And the U.S. Um, has not, the U.S. government slash media oligarchy has not um, opened its eyes to see what's really happening. Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, there are two people on the stack who've already spoken, and I will call on you, but I'm just hoping that I, I want to encourage people who haven't spoken to raise your hand and jump into the conversation. But right now I'm going to call on Norma and then Richard W. Norma, um, I'm sorry, I just, I just muted you instead of unmuted you. Sorry, go ahead, Norma. Um, I need to tell you, for one thing, David Paul has asked what that article that you mentioned, Sharon, was, and you know what I'm talking about. It's in the stack. It's in the chat. Yeah. The other, the other, um, at the twelve fourteen p.m. The other thing in the stack is Susan has asked about how much uh, internet availability okay. there is or something in uh, Nicaragua. But I wanted to tell you, my, my veneration yeah, is regular. Ben Linder went to Nicaragua during the early stages of the revolutionary government to build small dams. I see that Nicaragua has given us the answers to how to build revolution. Small dams means you don't ruin the, the river stream. 
and you do get the benefits of whatever electrification and so forth that a dam can provide brilliant, brilliant work. And of course, the, uh, the United States killed him, much to the horror of his parents who have since pursued activism. Uh, the other thing I've noticed is that Nicaragua is surviving despite the onslaught through their own production, their own control of their land, which is something that I think we need to urge as a major way of thinking about how we will ever gain our own revolution in the United States is by getting control of our land and producing on it what we need and what we like, all of course subsidized by all of us, by what co what's called taxes, that we, and, and that we begin to take over land that needs our care. There's so much of it that has been so stupidly damn well, excessively damaged by the profiteering that has gone on at every level, little bit and a huge bit. So those two methods need to be ad advising us about what to do in order to gain the revolution. Also those things give us this mentality to think about, yes, if we want to get along in a revolutionary stage away from the jobs and such, that big business profiteering requires, we're going to have to provide for ourselves in the best way possible by putting our hands in the earth. Thank you, Norma. Uh, Richard W. is next. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I just sort of wanted to um, sort of second some opinions here. Uh, and that is, when I was there, um, uh, fortunately, we got to go on a field trip uh, to the north, um, uh, north of Matagalpa and uh, into the, um, the coffee growing regions. Um, uh, and we visited an agricultural school out in the, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and had I, had I not done that, I would have come back a lot less impressed with the Nicaraguan Revolution. Um, because the people I was working with in Managua, um, they were actually, they were, they were the sons and the daughters of, um, uh, and they, and they were sent out of country during the revolution. They were like in Mexico learning technical skills. Um, you know, in particular, the, one of the people I worked with was, uh, was going to become a, a very high level computer person. In other words, he was a bureaucrat. Um, when we made the field trip, um, we, we met with, um, um, I guess it was maybe only think about 12 campesinos. Uh, they came up in one, one of these mini trucks. They were all stuffed in the back, the back end of this thing. I was amazed that they could all fit in there, but they did. Um, and we got a tour of, of, of the living conditions. Um, um, and why, why it was they was, why it was they were having a revolution. And, you know, what came through was, um, in, in large measure, they were having a revolution, not for themselves, but for their children. Um, and we, on the other side, uh, the Contras, uh, we were busy destroying, if you remember, there were the barefoot doctors. Uh, these are like the paramedics uh, that were going around trying to provide medical care. Um, and we were supporting the Contras that would go and attack these people. Uh, at this agricultural school, they would, uh, they sent out the guards uh, because the Contras would come in and they wouldn't destroy the equipment. What they would do is they would take like the seats of a tractor uh, so that they could use the tractor after, the, you know, when the revolution was lost. So they could get, you know, get this, you know, all they have to do is replace the seat and they have a tractor. Um, so, so basically, you know, I was impressed with one, the campesinos, um, 
they were the real they were the real winners, if you will, of the revolution. Or actually, the children were the real winners of the revolution. I was struck by the outhouse that uh, that you um, that you showed, and and I saw it myself. Yeah. Uh, so I'll I'll leave it with just that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, we've reached um, 12.30, and um, so now we're going to have more of an open discussion. Um, you, have, you have those two questions on the chat. Oh, that's, that thank I... you. There was uh, a question, Laura. Susan wanted to know the extent of the internet um, in Nicaragua. Oh, okay. Um, I... <laughs> So let's see, when we, we had internet at the places that we stayed, we, we, the main, our main base was in the sort of outskirts of Managua, which was where the friends of the ATC were. And it was this lovely school where the very first day I saw that beautiful bird. Um, and we all, uh, and we had internet there. It was a little bit better in the patio than in the rooms, but it was there. In the, in, and you, you can spend a lot of time outside in, in Nicaragua. Um, so that's comfortable. The hotels, the other places that we stayed had internet. It wasn't quite as good as the internet I have at my house, but it was um, pretty much available. Up at the farm, I'm not sure whether they had internet someplace, but I know that um, Terry Matson, the one of the delegation leaders, uh, was able to uh, get, um, I would, was able to post things using her phone. Um, and so she was able to get some kind of uh, reception that would sort of come and go. So she, when she caught it, then she'd you know, get a lot done and then it would be gone. But it's, it's like um, another friend of mine mentioned, she said, it's amazing, you go to Latin America, everybody's got a cell phone. You know, so but yeah, people do have cell phones. Um, and the, uh, the internet was pretty much available. Yeah. When I needed it, usually I was so tired at night, I just went to sleep, but, um, I wasn't on my computer all that much, but, uh, yeah, that answers that. Thank you. Um, so I think what we need to do is unmute everyone, but I don't know how to do that. Uh, Mehmet, can you do that, or Raj? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, we can take a look at it. Uh, not unmute, but give them the right to unmute uh, themselves, unmute which, oneself. which sorry, they do sorry. have the right, which they okay. do have the right now. So uh, I guess the uh, discussion goes on uh, uh, in an unmoderated way. So jump on and... Uh, interrupt anybody who's talking okay <laughs> i'm gonna i'm not going to completely stop mo moderating i mean <laughs> okay. so, <We're> good <laughs> we, we need to share <laughs> equally right. so please limit what you're saying to two or three minutes and so let everyone be able to speak and by the way hi david i just saw yes, you yes hi Matt. how are you doing <laughs> yeah. <Good to get. laughs> hi laura Thanks yeah david and Mehmet and i were on that trip two years to go to, to Venezuela. And just after that, actually, uh, David, Paul, and I were did a, a little presentation in Santa Cruz. And that night, David flew to Washington to be an embassy protector and was one of the four remaining embassy protectors of the Venezuelan embassy in Washington. And I'm so happy about the, our, uh, you know, co compadre. Oh, thanks. There were many protectors we left inside. Um, <laughs> yeah, you stayed inside. Yeah. A, it's interesting that the embassy is empty. It's not being used as an embassy because it's it just add to the farce that the Guaido position has any legitimacy at all. So um, they're not using it though he runs around the world saying he's president and our government supports him. So it's tough. But I was glad to, um, to share our experience about Nicaragua right before then and the Venezuela. Great. Yeah. Well, that the, 
embassy protection was an important show of solidarity for Venezuela. You know, the, 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 the countries feel that, you know, when, when they experience the solidarity of um, activists from the United States, they, they feel it very strongly. And I remember often that people would say, it's, we don't dislike Americans or, you know, Norte Americanos, but uh, it's your government. So I think that's a pretty generous attitude, but they always really do appreciate our solidarity. I was always concerned that our government in trying to delegitimize other governments we don't like that would, they'd pick a interim president like doing a Guaido thing. Uh, I don't think that'll happen with Nicaragua and possibly the trouble around the embassy would make them think twice about doing that. But, um, you know, that's just one way they try to delegitimize the government and just even years before an election, just say that it's a fraud. So don't pay attention to it. Just listen to us. And that's what the government's trying to do around Nicaragua, I imagine, leading up to the elections. And I think that the, my concern and um, I mean, people often say the sanctions don't work because they haven't toppled the, the government, but they do work in many ways. They cause a lot of suffering. And if they can cause suffering and chaos and economic collapse, that's part of their goal. So they are working in some ways, it's specifically with Venezuela. But what they don't understand is there, there is a growing sense of dignity and political consciousness due to the organizations of the mass movements and the government. I'm talking about specifically Venezuela and Nicaragua. That they can't they don't take into account as much uh, in their regime change. Um, so uh, yeah, I, when I hear uh, sanctions don't work, uh, like the Democrats were complaining to the Republicans in Congress, the sanctions aren't working. They have to be harder. When we get in, we can do it better. So <laughs> I don't like to, uh, yeah. So it, it, there's a lot to be concerned about, but I'm very hopeful from my last trip in Nicaragua as well as Venezuela that, um, well, I'll say one thing that when the Sandinistas lost, um, I heard from people in the FSLN there and in the ATC that they, um, they took for, well, they didn't, they didn't uh, do enough concentration on political organization and building cadre in, in, in the neighborhoods, but um, they started doing that. And, um, um, that's something they're very concentrating on now. And I think that's really important. And it behooves us to look at our own country. It's, you know, it's a very different situation that uh, we have to do sometimes the tedious hard work of educating our neighbors in our neighborhoods and, um, you know, to make change. So anyway, I'll, that's my two minute rant. I, I wanna say something quickly about, um, uh, ben Norton is somebody who reports a lot about Latin America, and he was, he was a speaker one evening. And he said that if people would have asked him a couple of weeks ago if they would put a Guaido and in, you know, try to do a Guaido to Nicaragua, he would have said, no, it's not going to happen. But then, you know, with various things happening, he, he said he sees more of a chance of that kind of thing happening now than he did a few weeks prior. And I wanna say one other thing is that the word dignity that you bring up is so important. Um, and, and it's right, right in there with sovereignty, sovereignty sort of at the nation level. But when people feel that their government is treating them with dignity, um, that means a lot. And of course, a lot of it has to do with the, the policies and the, you know, the benefits and things like that. But the, the dignity um, is another key word, dignidad. So thanks. You know, I, I've always thought it ironic that um, people who are fleeing the oppression and the, the gangs and, and the, 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 all the horrors in Central America come here, where, which is the source of their oppression. And um, I don't know if anyone has a better idea 
but I think um, it's something we should think about more than just, oh, well, it's ironic, but we should think about that more. Uh, I think uh, you're right, Sharon, but uh, remember that uh, famous uh, bank robber, um, I think he he was brought to court and the judge asked him, why do you keep robbing banks? I said, well, that's where the money is. <laughs> so uh, there is a difference between, you're right, between those countries and the United States or Europe is that uh, apart from the wealth, there is, uh, I, I guess, uh, regime wise, there is a bourgeois democracy that we enjoy here, maybe not for long, but uh, something that is lacking in the neo-colonial countries because of this imperialism's relationship. So that's why, I mean, I guess that's, uh, I mean, we are a victim of it. We, are, we have done the same thing. I mean, just escaped with the skin of our teeth from, uh, you know, Turkish fascism. And where did we end up? We ended up in uh, the United States. So, uh, and the Turkish coup was made by the United States. So... It is ironic, but uh, let's hope that uh, imperialist centers like Europe or United States or Canada doesn't fall back to the regime of those countries that we are talking about, which I unfortunately see that that's the way it's going. So, yeah. so that's, that's really scary. And what scares me is we're so... We we want to fight against the fascists here, but some of the things that have been done, like taking them out off uh, social media, yeah. certain groups and certain people can turn it, will turn around and be used against us. Glenn, exactly. Glenn, um, Glenn Greenwald has been saying that for a few months now. Yeah. So do we sacrifice the uh, freedoms that we have in order to silence some fascists? That is the whole thing, because you're absolutely right. Once you give those rights to the corporations, uh, either media, you know, newspapers or, or the, or the uh, Internet media now, they will just turn around and you, as we are seeing it in Facebook, Google, so on and so forth. You're, you're right. So the fight should be to expand the, 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 uh, the democracy, expand the freedoms instead of uh, being the advocate to shut it down. Um, if, if there are you know, fascists who are coming to the universities and using the pretext of free speech uh, like they do in Berkeley, I think they could be answered on the streets instead of asking the police, asking the government, asking the state to come in and pass legislation to prevent everybody from free speech. Right. Yeah, and the same goes for the corporations who are now jumping on the bandwagon to oppose the, um, the curtailment of uh, voting rights. You know, we should not give them any credit, in my opinion. We should not give them any legitimacy. I mean, because the Supreme Court ruled that they are they are people. Mm -hmm. We are we which we opposed, right? Um, we cannot. So we shouldn't legitimize them as people. I agree. Yes. Anybody else want to jump in the discussion? Yeah, this is Gary. Hi, Gary. Gary. Yeah, I've been I've been listening to this all along, but I've been I've been kind of like napping it as well. Um, go. go ahead. Okay, couple of couple of items on this business about all of these masses of people coming from Central America and South America and coming and coming to our borders and stuff like that. It's not our border. That border was ripped off from Mexico in the in the eighteen forties. I mean, the United States the United States stole one half of all Mexican territory in 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 that in that episode. That's right. The border crossed them. Yeah. So basically, 
I mean, so basically, what's what's wrong? What's wrong with people coming from south of the so-called border to resettle what's it, what's theirs in the first place? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's one. I mean, that's 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 one thing. Secondly, and this is this is autobiographical. My introduction to Cuba took place in 1964, when I was pointed when it was pointed out to me that the very people who were doing the counter-revolutionary stuff in the Escambray Mountains of Cuba in killing killing, um, literacy instructors and various and healthcare workers and stuff in those mountains were the very same people. I mean, the people who were bankrolling them were the very same people who were bankrolling the Ku Klux Klan and the sheriffs and all these other folks in Mississippi and Alabama. And those, and those were the Southern senators who had seniority in Congress and were in control of all of those powerful committees, which by the way is why, why many of us were about voter registration in the first place, because we wanted, to, we wanted to see what we can do about getting those guys out of there. Anyway, when, when when I learned about that connection, I didn't want to hear any kind of BS anymore about Fidel Castro. And actually within the next couple of years, people introduced me to pamphlets that were written, speeches that he had made and things like that. And I had one, I have the first and second declaration of Havana which were my second source of textbooking for uh, teaching folks how to read and write during that period. And that, I mean, that book went right next to um, Elements of Style by Strunk and White. So I used, I mean, I was using both of those books during, during the late 60s. That's cute. <laughs> Name name the book again that you had alongside uh, Strunk and White. The first and second declarations of Havana. Okay, thank you. They were the they were the two major speeches made by Fidel Castro. One during the early part of that year of this was this was sixty one. Okay, and the other speech was made later during that year in the fall of sixty one. After the after the Bay after the Bay of Pigs uh, episode, but they were they were these two speeches that he made in front of these in front of these mass audiences at the plaza in Havana. Mm-hmm. And I think on the second speech, I mean, if I recall right, he said he um. He said something like, we all know what's going on, so I'm going to keep my remarks short. And half a million people were screaming from the, from the, from the sidewalk, no. <laughs> For that, Fidel, that would be like five hours. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I can jump in, um, there was uh, Raul Castro when the Organization of American States finally allowed Cuba in. And uh, apparently every head of state gets a certain amount of time to speak. And he just kept talking and said that because I haven't been here for so many years, I figure I get more time. And so he just talked way beyond the um, supposed allotted time. And I'm sure that it was all worth hearing. Uh Uh-huh. Yep. Well, I think we need to consider specific demands on on Biden administration. Um, we, I think, first of all, he should um, reinstate the Obama policy toward Cuba, and the fact that he doesn't want to do that is really awful. And we, we should target that, and we should also target certain key other things, key things. To, uh, raise 
as demand. So what are those specific things that Obama did that we want that we want done now? And if and and quite frankly, do they do those things go far enough? No, of course they don't, but but just I mean can just can, going can, back can we be can we be pushing the envelope further? Yeah, yeah. I think you have to get out into the neighborhoods out of, yeah, and, and really press the issues. I, I, it does you no good for a group of 20 or 50 people to, to press Biden right. if he doesn't have pressure. And the only way you're going to develop pressure is by getting out, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I go back to Dolores Huerta, uh, who, who did the house, house meetings uh, as, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as sort of a model. It does you no good to, to talk about you know you know having fifty people write uh, if you if you've got five hundred people that don't do anything and you really need to get out there and 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 make them this this thing here should be like a hundred times more people you know tuning in than than what it's got. Jen, I'd like to say something, jump in on this for a minute, because one of the things I get a little upset by is people seem to understand there's this uncivil war going on between the Democrats and Republicans, and that somehow we should support the Democrats. Um, you know, that, that's just wrong think in my, in my view, because when, when Biden says, you know, oh, well, democracy has been restored, my question was, well, democracy for which class? We need to read our Lenin, we need to read Marx, Engels, and so forth, and understand, you know, the state supports uh, the ruling class, supports, and in our case, that support, that's the Democrats and Republicans both support these classes. Yeah, so, Gene. We, but let me just finish, let me just finish, finish in a final statement here that neither of these groups represent the people of the United States. And we need to at least be aware of that and start talking about American democracy. And okay. understand. Okay, uh, Gene. I'll have something after, one more thing, but go ahead, Gary. Yeah, a couple of things around that. First of all, um, I mean, I think, I, I don't think anybody would disagree with you about the, about the fact that there's, you know, there's, there's not a dime of difference between, you know, between the Democrats and the Republicans. Our job as revolutionaries is to know when to grab that dime and spin it around. As, as, as you know, as bad as things might be with, with, with that two-party system, we need, to, we need to understand strategy and tactics. And we and and you know and 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 I and I I agree in ge in general in general there's not a, there's not there's not a lot of difference between the Democrats and the Republicans, but we need to know the difference between strategy and tactics, yeah. and how to and how to use those things creatively. And if we don't, we're gonna you know we're gonna lose time and time again. Well, let me just say one last thing on that is uh, I don't get out much, as you know, but uh, back in 1998, I went to the 150th anniversary of the publication of the Communist Manifesto in Havana. And when we're having these discussions, one of the North Americans says, well, how can you say you have democracy when you only have one party? And the Cuban response was, under Batista, we had seven parties and no democracy. Now we have one party and we have democracy. Right, so and, Julius, throw and that Julius, out. Julius Nereri said when he was alive that even the United States only has one party. The only thing is that, that, there's, that, the, that they have enough affluence to be able to afford two. Well, that, that, that's true, but we can't really afford one, one of those. I know. But we agree on that, Gary. And I, good to see you. Uh, hey. Yeah, it's not. It's it's not. It's not bad being it's not bad being around and alive and aware about this about this stuff. Yeah, and it won't be long before we uh, start yeah. having meetings at the library too. And I hope we can integrate Zoom on on that. Right, Laura. Um, check. 
check the chat that I, I sent you earlier about the, about the canal. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've saved the chat, so I, I will I will do that. Did you say, so that, that'll be from Gary? Is that who was speaking? Yeah. Okay, I'll look but, for that. But I should probably share, share with a couple of folks now. Oh, please do. It goes back to the, this canal stuff goes all the way back to the 1850s. Before that. And the idea was, the idea was to build, there was no Panama Canal. The idea was to build this canal because you had this Lake Nicaragua, which, right. which just shortened the distance and stuff like that. And the United States came down to Nicaragua and told them, you are not going to do this because you'll be violating the Monroe Doctrine. We will inter and we will intervene militarily. So you you can you can, you can take your contractors and get them out of it. The contractors, by the way, was a French was a French corporation by the name of Suez. Huh. Huh. Oh, that's interesting. And know. they went and they and they went elsewhere, as we know. Yeah. Right. Well, it's two minutes to one, and I don't see any oh. other hands. So, yeah, or anybody else jumping in. So, I think this might be a good time to close out. I mean, oh, Yo Yusuf, you want to speak? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, well uh, the, the Nicaragua uh, Canal would have been a sea level canal. The Panama Canal is not a sea level canal. You have to raise the ships. Uh, 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 it, it goes through mountains and you have to raise each ship uh, uh, and lower them back. Right. So a, a, a Nicaragua uh, Canal would have been uh, more efficient. Uh, I, just, I, I want to um, uh, explain that parenthetically. And didn't they liberate Panama from Colombia somewhere along the way? So I think they build a canal there. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. That's. I, th I think Vanderbilt had something to do with this too, because didn't he promise a railroad that would that would go east west faster uh, than than a uh, than a canal? I, I I believe I heard something. I in, remember where, in, in Panama or in, in Nicaragua. He was going to build a, a railroad down to Nicaragua that would uh, that would. Uh, uh, facilitate shipping uh, from east to west coast faster than uh, uh, than than having a canal. That was the that was the the, the thought. Uh, Maybe he was going to call that the Belt and Road. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> You're right. So I wanted I, I wanted to remind you, me that there is no up or down in space. And when we speak of going down, there is a, an implication of a lesser direction, a lesser quality to wherever that is, and that we might well be served. You know, that's a Euro, uh, whatever, European aspect using a map that the Europeans have in front of us instead of a map that rectifies the problem. We should be talking about going there or to or whatever and not up or down. Well, we can do what some some progressive map makers have done in recent years. You can turn the hemispheric map of it, this hemispheric map upside down. Or we could stand on our heads. Yeah. Well, wow, that, yeah, that well, you, you can do all kinds of things to dismiss this. But when you speak of going down, when you speak of, when you speak of going down to such as Nicaragua, there is an implication of it's a lesser place. Well, I think okay. that should be um, the judgment of the individual who who is. Well, I'm saying it should be a general understanding, and when somebody says it, it should they should be told there's no up or down in space, and that there is it's a political thing to say. You're going down to. So how like, is it? How is it that you know, growing up in Maine, people used to refer going down east, even from Texas. Uh, that's one expression. That in California, <laughs> it's back east. Back east, yeah. <laughs> uh huh. 
<laughs> my my son says that there should be, who's in his thirties, he, he says that there should be one time. So there oh, should be a global time. time, right? So if it's a, a 24 hour clock, right? So if it's 1300, so people here would know that it's 1300 is, it's sunny and people on the other side of the world would just know that 1300 is, is not, it's is dark. And everybody would get along much better if you didn't have to translate time from one, from one um, zone to another. And I think that's probably gonna happen eventually for humanity uh, to decide to uh, do uh, what do you do? What do you do north of the Arctic Circle where six months of the year it's dark and six months of the year it's light? Well, if, if you need to refer to a certain time that you're making an appointment with someone who lives in the Antarctic, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. You'll just have one time. Everybody, you'll know what time it is. Uh -huh. well, there, the, well, there is. A, it's it's called Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, uh, the choice yes. of the the meridian is a little. Uh, the, the, there has been a, a talk of changing the the meridian, but. Um, uh, and also the map, uh, is it, uh, and, and there is a more uh, map with no up or down. It's polar projection. Uh, How about quarks? Map, uh, 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 map of uh, the United uh, where that the United Nations uses in its. How about the up and down quarks? I mean, oh, 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 up and, uh, one better than the other. <laughs> uh, no, that doesn't. Uh, 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 <laughs> Well, we, the, that has to be, uh, then it, it's their behavior under a, a magnetic field. That's why. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. On that note, we're going to say yeah. goodbye <laughs> and hope to see you all here again next week. Okay. Right. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. People. Thank you very much, Laura. Oh, thank you, thank you all. Yeah, thank, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Laura. Raj, thank you. Yes, uh -oh. thanks a lot, Laura. Okay. See you next thank week. You. See you next week. Wear your magnetic shoes next week. <laughs> <laughs>